you can please take a seat, that'd be great, thank you. Can we just be still for a few moments? I just want to reflect on um, the beginning part of our meeting, the worship part. So let's close our eyes. I just want you to think about a few things. When we're taking communion, we were reminded that we're around God's table. Reminded that we can approach God and speak to God about anything. And we were simulating it with being with friends and family. But how do you see yourself in God's presence? Do you feel worthy because of possibly how you feel about yourself to be there? Do you feel able to approach him in conversation around this table? Or are things there marring the way you see yourself and therefore affecting how you are with God? Our identity as individuals, the way we look at ourselves, the way we see ourselves, the way we think of ourselves, determines how we relate to people around us, in this room, in this world, wherever we are. And there are pointers in life which um, paint a picture of how we could be. When I was uh, 11 years old, I went to high school. You can look at me now if you want to. <laughs> nice view at the front here, isn't it? <clears throat> I went to high school. And uh, I wasn't much taller than I was now. <laughs> I was one of the shortest in the class. I was also um, uh, this colour, as you can see. And this was during the race riots. So basically, being this colour, being short, wasn't the best thing uh, at that time in uh, school. So I was bullied, picked on. Uh, when it came to football at school, there used to be, we used to be lined up against the wall, and it would be, I'd be the last person left to be picked, and they would fight who would take me. Even having me in their team as an extra person, they would not even contemplate doing that. That's what school life was like for me. Nothing's changed, really. So, uh, <laughs> and then on the way home from school, uh, there'd be the racial things going on. So I'll be going home, I'll be on the bus. Remember, I was only a couple of inches short than I am now. So um, I, was, I, was about, I was probably four foot tall. So where's Dennis? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So, uh, I was quite short, and you know, these, I was 11, 12, you're on a bus, you look out the window, then 15 skinheads come up on the bus, give you a good kick in, and say to you, that's for looking out the window at us. Oh. So these are the things I experienced in life, and these are little pointers in life, which could, you know, make the person I am today, yeah? So each of you have got good situations, bad situations in your life, from young to old, which carry on, which are bombarding you in life, which um, characteristically make you who you are. Yeah? So the way you see yourself, the way you think about yourself, are determined sometimes by what you experience in life. Yeah? Does that make sense? So each of you in this room may have things in your life 
which make you see things in a certain way. With people around you, friends, work colleagues, neighbours, whoever, but also with God as well. Also with God as well. And it affects the way we relate to people. Let me continue with my story. At 17, I became a Christian. And um, I was uh, here at 17 years old, and my brother Ralph's baptism, he got baptised. And uh, the person speaking, Reverend John Bunt, and it was as if this big, massive finger was pointing at me. and talking to me about putting God in your life and putting him first in your life. So when he done an appeal, I went forward, became a Christian, got baptised the following Easter. But my experience with God showed me what my real identity was. Because all those things which happened in my school days, did have an effect on me. I had a problem with the colour I was because I was beaten up because of my colour. I had a problem with relating to people, so I used to be very mouthy. That hasn't changed. (laughs) But what it meant was, is that the way I saw people around me up to 17 or 18 was affected because of what I experienced myself as an individual. But coming to God, I realised one thing. God created me. God made me this way. Those things I experienced are immaterial because of who I am in God. They're important factors in life, but it changed the way I saw myself. And it meant that I knew who I was. I'm still finding out who I was as well, and am. And that is a child of the living God. But the thing about it is, is we can come to God and still struggle with these things in our life. And it hasn't been dealt with. And it affects the way we are, again with each other, and again with God. So coming round that table and talking to God about things in your life, good things and bad things, that may be the hardest thing you can do because you don't feel worthy of doing that. Let's turn to the Bible, shall we? If you go to 1 Colossians, 1 Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his bloodshed on the cross." We have been created by Jesus for him. Each one of you have been created for him. Who you been created for? For who? Are you sure? So each one of you have been created for Jesus. If you turn to your Bible to Psalm 139, we're going to read part of this as well. Psalm 
And it says this. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. And you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My fame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. If you read the account in Genesis, it also says we have been created in God's image. Now, the thing about it is God created all of us in this room. He created all of us. And look at, look at each other. We're all unique, all different, all short, some short, some tall, some white, some black, some other colours. We are all different and all unique. We've all been made by God. And we all have purpose in life. Every one of us have purpose in life. The thing about it is, that purpose is often marred because of the way we see ourselves. So when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Physically, what you see inside yourself, do you like what you see? Are there things you want to change? What does God see when he looks at you? What does God see when he looks at you? God loves you. God is saying, that is my creation. I love every part of that person. But what do you see? It's when we come to Jesus and realise our identity in Jesus. John 1.12 says... Yet to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to be children of God. Amen. So each of you in this room have been created by God, made into his likeness, but also you are his children. You are his child. And, you know, when Mendy and I became parents, there's a... In this passage in, one, in, in Psalm 139, it talks about him knowing when we go to sleep, when we, when we wake up. And uh, when Heather and Holly were younger, I remember the problem sometimes to get them into bed. But once they're asleep, as parents, you go into that room, you look and watch and the love you have for that child is there. That's immense love. And you look at that child that's lying there and breathing and uh, just being still. And I can imagine God being like that with us, that he watches us sleep. He watches us wake up. And his reaction 
is magnified because of who he is to what he feels about us. And uh, he sees us sleeping, living. He sees our heart beating. He sees our thoughts. He sees everything about us. And all he can see, despite what Heather done the other day, or what Holly done the other day, love, 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 love. And, you know, in Psalm it talks about, he knows your thoughts. He knows everything you're going to say before you're going to say it. He knows more about yourself than you know about yourself. He knows what you thought yesterday. Oh, it wasn't good, was it? No, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. He knows what you're going to th- think tomorrow. And some of those things aren't that good. It's true. And I'm talking about myself here. <laughs> And Wendy will vouch for that as well. <laughs> Steve's being Steve again. But that's how God sees you. When he created you in your mother's womb, he knew exactly how you're going to live. He knows exactly how you're going to die. He knows your days, your numbers, everything. And, you know, what we do in life is this. We try and better ourselves. And as Christians, we do the same thing. But let me give you an example. You go to those self-motivation conferences, maybe. You go to as many Christian conferences where there's, uh, for women or for men, as many as you can can in a year. Uh, You read the Bible. What's your reason for reading the Bible? Get closer to God? Well, that's to read it. You know? There is a, there's a reason for everything. Then there's the fitness thing we do. We want to look better. I know I've got to look better, and there's a reason behind that. It's called health. But we're always trying to do something different, to make ourselves different. And all that stuff is fine, as long as God's the centre of why you're doing it. But if you're doing it because... The people at work keep on saying this about me. You're doing it to please people around you. That's the wrong reasons for doing anything. And as people of God, we are big enough and strong enough because of who we are in God to be who we are because God's created us this way. And very often we be who we are not to be we get pushed from pillar to post by people around us because we want to be people pleasers rather than God pleasers. And church, it's time to realign yourself individually and as a body of people where God wants you to be. Let me tell you a story. There's a guy here called Chris Davey. Chris, how old were you when you, was, uh, when you became a Christian? Uh, I was about 16. And uh, you got baptised last year, so that's 44 years, isn't it? 57 you are? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry, I, th- I thought you was older than me for some reason. Right. <laughs> Chris became a Christian at 16 got baptised last year and the reason why I'm using Chris as an example is um, because of uh, as we put God first in our life he empowers us to be the people and identity he wants us to be yeah so we had conversations with Chris for many years while he's here about baptism but I'm right in saying you thought I was okay yeah Chris gets baptised last year and uh, the Holy Spirit has transformed him uh, to who he is now. What could have happened in the last 30 years if you'd done it earlier? But the most important thing is, it's where you are today, Chris. Yeah, you've done that, you've made that difference, but the powerful thing is what we see in you 
because of what you've done with God. And each of us in this room have got crossroads with God. It could be the baptism thing. It could be the leaving the job you're at thing, which he's been telling you to do for 10, 15 years, but you're still there. It could be the location of where you're living. The Bible says, come to God and you'll find yourself, basically, and you find who you are in God, and you find your identity in life, and you find your purpose in life. And yes, we repent, believe, and be baptised, those things we need to do. But we need to continue that in our life, in being obedient to God and following God. And as we align ourselves with God, we will see wonderful things happen through us because of who we are in God. If we decide to go to the right when God wants us to go to the left, our experience of God will be slightly different. So every time we have crossroads in life, it's up to us to make that stand and go for it. And then we'll see a transformed community, a transformed world, as we put God first in what he wants us to do in life. You know, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, 28, it says that we're created in God's image. If you look at Colossians, the first passage we spoke about earlier on, it says that Jesus was made in God's image. Are we the same as Jesus? There's a difference. If you look at the passage in Genesis 1, 28... The word image is the word besalem. I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but it doesn't matter. Which means resemblance of God. So we resemble God. We've been created to look and be like God. So we are creative people. We make decisions. We are, we're, you know, we're similar to God in certain ways. But if you turn to the passage in Colossians, the word there is a different word. The word is, how do you, how do you pronounce this one? E I K O N. Icon? Yeah, I, uh, icon. That word means. Mirror-like, exact reflection, supreme expression. That is the, that is the description of God, Jesus being an image of God. So Jesus is the perfect image of God in that body. We are a resemblance of, 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 uh, of God. And the reason why I'm sharing this is quite simply is this. Jesus is the gateway to God. As we come to God through Jesus, we come to this perfect gateway, this perfect person who represents every single thing of God. Let me show you a few things here. I'm going to uh, skip a few slides. If these things work, technology. Can you read that? This is who Jesus is. He's all those things and more. He's the bread of life. He's God. He's the Son of Man, Lord of glory. All those things he is. And that's who we identify ourselves with when we come to Jesus. That leaves me with two things here, basically.
There's a passage in Corinthians which says that Jesus died for us, that we can be righteous. That those who come to him can be like Jesus through his spirit working through us. It connects us with God. The thing about it is, in the world we live in, many people look at themselves in a marred way because of the things which have been thrown at them in life. We look around us and uh, models are a certain shape. You look, at, so you look at certain films, people look at it in a certain way in films. We've been thrown at us what we should look at, what we should be, what we should say, what we should drink, what we should eat. Everything is thrown at us what we should be. And the thing about it is, us in this room have the opportunity to identify us with Jesus, come to Jesus, realise our identity in Jesus, and express those things we saw on that screen earlier on of who Jesus is. Because one thing we are to be is be, to be reflectors of Jesus. Did you know, when they landed on the moon in the uh, 60s, their expression of the moon was this. It's a dark rock with no life in it at all. It's a dark rock with no life in it at all. Yes, there is some definition here and there, but there's no life there at all. When you're down on this earth, at night time, you look at the moonlight, and you think, wow, that, that is beautiful, isn't it? But all that is, is the reflection of the light of the sun coming from the moon. And God wants to do something through us to reflect something of his light in our lives which may be marred, which may be a bit whatever, so that he can reflect something of him through us. He sees authority when he sees us. He sees high priest when he sees us through Jesus. He sees you as his children. If we approach God as his children, we will pray to him in a different way. If we approach God as a person who's going through difficulty in life and is struggling with anything around us and we can't find what our identity is, we will approach him in a certain way. But if we approach him as a child of the living God, knowing what our identity is, knowing what he can do, we approach him in a certain way. So when you go on that table, you approach him in a different way. When you have coffee with him, you approach him in a different way. Uh, the way we see ourselves, the way we see our identity, affects the way we see ourselves with God. Now yesterday was a great example. I got a phone call yesterday from one of my customers saying a delivery has not arrived. And uh, this is a delivery for the NEC for a show they're putting together which starts basically Monday afternoon. And uh, the bits I was providing were metal construction pieces which they can't finish the job or even start part of the job until it's been delivered. So I get a phone call yesterday saying it hasn't arrived. My supplier was told to deliver it yesterday, not yesterday, day before yesterday, after four o'clock. I rang up my supplier. I got the old message, we are closed between these hours on Monday and Friday and not open Saturday. So I had no way of contacting this person. So for four to five hours, I was 
I, I wasn't in a panic, was I, Wendy? No. We, I was thinking about this situation I was in, continually. I went on Facebook to try and find the person's number on Facebook who I was dealing with. I had no mobile numbers, nothing. And eventually I sent an email out, but my customer said to me, yesterday afternoon at about five o'clock, yesterday evening, as long as it's with me Monday, I'm happy. And all the way through this struggle, there's this thing saying in my head, do not be anxious about anything, do not be anxious about anything, do not be anxious about I kept on being anxious about everything, didn't I? <laughs> and uh, Wendy said, no, you meant to be doing your sermon. I goes, well, my sermon is sort of uh, juggling in my head with uh, the stuff that's going at work. And Wendy said to me, just put the work thing away and get on with your sermon. Because, you know, you, God's got it under control. We got an email yesterday from the customer, my supplier, and he's made a mistake with the delivery. Let me ask you a question. If I say, please deliver on Friday after two o'clock, what does that mean to you? <laughs> okay, All right. what's, it mean? what's it mean to you? I'd deliver it on Friday. After? But not before two o'clock. After two o'clock? Mm. I didn't realise you wanted it on Friday, that's why we're delivering it Monday morning. Oh. I didn't interpret it as being delivered on Friday, on Friday, after two o'clock, to be on Friday. <laughs> so, uh, never mind, it's being delivered Monday. So, uh, but the, the whole point of that thing is, is that we struggle with nothing sometimes, where we've got no control at all, and we struggle, and we struggle, and we struggle. Me going on Facebook, did it make much difference? Me making an email, sending an email in the morning at nine o'clock when I first started off, he got that email later on in the day. It didn't make a jot of difference, me doing all the things I needed to do to try and, and contact this person. Because <coughs> he would have contacted me anyway, and the outcome would have been the same anyway, and my customer would have got your stuff anyway. But I was panicking, and I didn't put God first. Because I should have been sitting down do, practicing what I preach, which is not be too anxious about anything. And that is probably my identity shining out there, something I need to deal with. And that we all do that, don't we? We juggle, we juggle, we juggle, we juggle, and then we let God. Yeah? And the question with juggling in life is this. When does God's ball get in there? Because we're going to put our hands down, drop all the balls, and let God deal with everything around us. Now, you see, this picture of this girl represents a lot of people out in the world who have no, no idea of who Jesus is. Young and old, who have a low esteem of themselves, who have no hope in their life. And yet if we come to Jesus, this is what we have. It took me a long time to do this slide. This is who we are in Jesus. Dead to sin, royal priesthood, forgiven, sort of the earth, God's righteousness, all those things, living stones. This is who you are in God. That is your identity. That is who you are if you come to Jesus. The passage in John 3.16 is quite well known. He has died for us for the things we do wrong, that we can approach God if we turn around from the life we live. And then he comes in. He gives us a peace of himself, his Holy Spirit, that links with us and God. 
and creates in us the beings we're meant to be. That's our identity, children of God. Let me show you another picture. How to see you is not important, it's how you see yourself means everything. Look at the shadow, it gives it away. How God sees you can be very different to how you see yourselves. He sees each of you as people with potential to be people who can change the world around us. Amongst you, you have neighbours, you have friends, you may have friends, I don't know, but I'm sure you have got friends. You've got work colleagues who do not have this hope in life through Jesus. In Hebrews 6.19, hope anchors the soul. And that's having a hope in Jesus anchors everything of who we are in this world we live in. And the issue is, this room represents a hundred of people who are connected with thousands of people during the week. And there are many, many people you're connected with who do not have the hope or the direction in life which we get through Jesus. And it's our responsibility to be that light, that salt, in the areas God's place us into, to make a difference to those people around us. So the question I want to ask you is, one, where's your identity today? How do you see yourselves now? How does God see you? Two Corinthians three eighteen says this. And we, who with unfailed faces, all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is his spirit. As we come to God, we become more and more and more like him. He is changing us more and more in his likeness. And with that comes power and authority. It says that on the wall there, the Lord is a warrior. What are we? What are we? What are we? What are we? What do warriors do? Fight, did you say? What else do they do? Conquer. 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 What else do we do? Overcome. Overcome. What else do we do? We take ground. So we are warriors. And what, what we become is not warriors, but warriors. <laughs> okay? A bit, di- a bit of a difference there, isn't there? We become warriors. We worry about everything. It's the example of us, me being a warrior. But we are warriors for God. 
there's a difference in, in that, in terms of our identity. And what we've become as a church in this whole world, we haven't been the voice we're meant to be. We're meant to be a loud voice of hope to the world around us. We're meant to be the body of Christ wherever we are. And we've allowed people to trample on us. And it's time to take a stand as warriors of Jesus to be the people of God he's called us to be using the most powerful weapon he's given us which is love. Love conquers everything. Love breaks down doors. But when I say the word love you're thinking of the gooey type of love. God's love saw his son nailed on a cross. God's love saw Jesus uh, throwing tables down in a temple. God's love saw Jesus rebuking the hierarchy in his lifetime. he done that to make a difference for others. And we as people of God are to reflect how God is and be how God is. So all the things we see in ourselves allow God's spirit to channel himself through you and be the person of authority he wants you to be. Let's stand, shall we? If you feel more comfortable sitting down, sit down, that's fine. I want you to close your eyes. We can keep them open, it's up to you. But I want you to concentrate on one thing. Of who you are in Jesus. Of your identity. Who do you think you are? Well, I can tell you who I think you are. You are a child of God. God wants to transform the world to be in through you. He wants you to take ground and he wants you to be assertive in who you are in Jesus. Father God, I pray for your spirit just to brood upon us now and touch every person in this room now. And I pray for the... I forgot to say something. There is an enemy... And he will do anything he can to destroy the way you think of yourself. That's his plan. That's why Jesus came to destroy anything he wants to do. I pray, Father, that people, whatever they think about themselves now, Father, I pray, Father, they'll see in the light what they really are. Children of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just want you to... I know some saw that picture up top. One that's up on the screen now. And some of you registered with that completely. That's how you feel about yourself in various forms. If you're a man, stick yourself as a man in the image. Some of you saw yourself like that woman in the wheelchair. Not how she saw herself on the shadow, but you saw her, and you see yourself as somebody in the wheelchair. Throughout the entire time that Steve was speaking, this one passage came to me from Ephesians 3, and it is so misunderstood that we forget what it says. And I want to just, for you for a minute, just to listen. It's Paul speaking, obviously. 
For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What's missed out in that bit, what we sometimes miss, is the fact that this power through his spirit is in your inner being. I don't want to preach, but the point of this is very quickly, is that you grasp in your inner person, your very inner being, your very inner self, that power that grasps how long, wide, deep and high the love of Christ is for you, actually is in your inner being, becomes so part of you, you can't be anything else but be that child of God. So when you're sitting there thinking to yourself, how can I change that image that I have of me? You can't. It is you relinquishing to the power of the Holy Spirit and saying, strengthen my inner being. You make it happen, Lord, because I can't. So take a minute now just to reflect what that means for you. Actually say to God, whether you quite fully believe the message is irrelevant, quite frankly, because you don't get it until it starts happening. But actually relinquish now to God. Requesting now that strength through his spirit. Do it for yourself. Lord, do pray. Father, that for all of us, when we look at the picture now that's up on the screen, we see an image of that's what you're doing to us. It is by your hand, by your outreaching, by your power, that each of us will be strengthened in our inner being. The junk that sits in us the stuff that makes us believe or not believe that we are capable of doing all through you for your glory and for your power. Lord, that that is changed within us. I pray for each and everybody now to have a feel of your spirit, Lord, that they know within their inner being right now in the name of Jesus that the changes will start occurring. The pain may hurt, but they will see the change occur. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.